a fistful of brains, grabs a torch and sets fire to the grey goo. The demon howls and grabs blindly for the burning brains. Khan snatches the other head from its hand. He throws it to the ground and mashes it to a pulp with his axe. The demon shudders, then slumps. More, comes a call from near the gate. It's late, later than demons usually attack. Most of the warriors on the main watch have retired for the night, replaced by children like me. Our eyes and ears are normally sharp, but this close to dawn, most of us are sleepy and sluggish. We've been caught off guard. The demons have snuck up. They have the advantage. Bodies spill out of huts. Hands grab spears, swords, axes, knives. Men and women race to the rampart. Most are naked, even those who normally fight in clothes. No time to get dressed. Demons pound on the gate and scale the banks of earth outside, tearing at the sharpened wooden poles of the fence, clambering over. The two-headed monster might have been a diversion sent to distract us or else it just had a terrible sense of direction, as many corpse demons do. Warriors mount ladders or haul themselves up onto the rampart to tackle the demons. It's hard to tell how many monsters there are, definitely five or six, and at least two are real demons. For Mori. Khan arrives at the gate, shouting orders. He bellows at those on watch who've strayed from their posts. Stay where you are! Call if clear! The trembling children return to their positions and peer into the darkness, waving torches over their heads. In turn, they yell, Clear! 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 One starts to shout, Clear! Then screams, No! Three of them over here! With me! Gaul roars at Ina and the others who fought the first demon. They held back from the battle at the gate in case of a second attack like this. Gaul leads them against the trio of demons. I see fury in his face. He's not furious with the demons, but with himself. He made a mistake with the first one and let it knock him down. That won't happen again. As the warriors engage the demons, I move to the center of the wrath and wait. I don't normally get involved in fights. I'm too valuable to risk. If the demons break through the barricades, or if an especially powerful Fomori comes up against us, that's when I go into action. To be honest, I doubt I could do much against the stronger Fomori. Everybody in the raft knows that, but we pretend I'm a great priestess, mistress of all the magics. The lie comforts us and gives us some faint shadow of hope. The younger children of the raft cluster around me, watching their parents fight to the death against the foul legions of the other world. Their older brothers and sisters are at the foot of the rampart, passing up weapons to the adults, ready to dive into the breach if they fall. But these young ones wouldn't be of much use. I hate standing with them. I'd rather be at the rampart, but duty comes at a price. Each of us does what we can do best. My wishes don't matter. The welfare of the wrath and my people comes first. Always. One of the Fomori makes it over the fence, half human, half boar, a long jaw, a mix of human teeth and tusks, demonic yellow eyes, claws instead of hands. It bellows at the warriors who go up against it, then spits blood at them. The blood hits a woman in the face. She shrieks and topples back off the rampart. Her flesh is bubbling. The demon blood is like fire. I race to the woman. It's Skota. We share a hut sometimes. I'm passed around from hut to hut now Bamba's gone. Her usually pale skin is an ugly red color. Bubbles of flesh burst. The liquid sizzles. Skota screams. I press my palms to her forehead ignoring the heat of her flesh and the burning drops of liquid which strike my skin. I mutter the words of a calming spell. Skota sighs and relaxes, eyes closing. I tug a small bag from my belt, open it and pour coarse green grains into the palm of my left hand. Dropping the bag, I spit over the grains and mix them together with a finger forming a paste. I rub the paste into Skota's disfigured flesh and it stops dissolving. She'll be scarred horribly, but she'll live. There are other pastes and lotions I can use to help the wounds heal cleanly, but not now. There are demons to kill first. I look up. The boar demon has been pierced in several places by the swords and knives of our warriors, but still it fights and spits. I wish I knew where these monsters got their unnatural strength from. Screams behind me. The children. A spider-shaped Fomori has crawled out of the hut over the souterrain. The beast must have found the exit hole outside the wrath and made its way up the tunnel, then broke through the planks covering the entrance. Khan hears the screams. He looks for warriors to send to their aid. Before he can roar orders, 
two brothers hurl themselves into the demon's path, Ronan and Lorcan, the Wrath's red-headed twins, barely sixteen years old. Their younger brother, Erk, was killed several months ago. The twins were always strong fighters, even as young children, but since Erk fell, they fought like men possessed. They love killing demons. Khan refocuses on the demons at the gate. He doesn't bother sending other warriors to deal with the spider. He trusts the teenage twins. They might be among the youngest warriors in the Wrath, but they're two of the fiercest. Ronan and Lorcan move in on the spider demon. Now that it's closer, I see that although it has the body of a large spider, it has a dog's face and tail. Demons are often a mix of animals. Bamba used to say they stole the forms of our animals and ourselves because they didn't have the imagination to invent bodies of their own. Ronan, the taller of the pair with long, curly, flowing hair, has two curved knives. Lorcan, who cuts his hair close and whose ears are pierced with a variety of rings, carries a sword and a small scythe. They're both skilled at fighting with either the left or right hand, but before they can tackle the dog spider, it shoots hairs at them. The hairs run all the way along its eight legs and act like tiny arrows when flicked off sharply. The hairs strike the brothers and cause them to stop and cover their faces with their hands to protect their eyes. They hiss, partly from the pain but mostly with frustration. The Fomori moves forward, barking with evil delight, and the twins are forced back, chopping blindly at it. I could call Khan for assistance, but I want to handle this on my own. I won't place myself at risk, but I can help, leaving the warriors free to concentrate on the larger, more troublesome demons. I hurry to the beehives. We kept them outside the raft before the attacks began, but certain demons have a taste for honey, so we move them in. The bees are at rest. I reach within a hive and grab a handful of bees, then prize them out, whispering words of magic so they don't sting me. Walking quickly, I place myself behind Ronan and Lorcan. Taking a firm stance, I thrust my hand out and whisper to the bees again, a command this time. They come to life within my grasp. Move, I snap. Ronan and Lorcan glance back at me, surprised, then step aside. I open my fingers and the bees fly straight at the dog spider, attacking its eyes, stinging it blind. The Fomori whines and slaps at his eyes with its legs, losing interest in everything except the stinging bees. Ronan and Lorcan step up, one on either side. Four blades glint in the light of the torches, and four hairy legs go flying into darkness. The demon collapses, half its legs gone, sight destroyed. Ronan steps on its head, takes aim, then buries a knife deep in its brain. The dog spider stiffens, whines one last time, then dies. Ronan withdraws his knife and wipes it clean on his long hair. His natural red hair is stained an even darker shade of red from the blood of demons. Lorcan stubble his blood cake too. They never wash. Ronan looks at me and grins. Nice work. Then he runs with Lorcan to where Khan and his companions are attempting to drive the demons back from the fence. I take stock. Gaul's section is secure. The demons are retreating. The boar-shaped Fomori has been pushed back over the fence. It's clinging to the poles, but its fellow demons aren't supporting it. When Ronan and Lorcan hit, blades turning the air hot, it screams shrilly, then launches itself backwards, defeated. Conla, Con's son, fires a spear after the demon. He yells triumphantly. It must have been a hit. Conla picks up another spear, aims, then lowers it. They're retreating. We've survived. Before anyone has a chance to draw breath, there's a roar of rage and loss. It comes from near the back of the wrath. Amargin, Ninian's father. He's cradling the dead boy in his arms. He had five children once. Ninian was the last. The others and his wife were all killed by demons. Khan hurries across the rampart towards Amargin to offer what words of comfort he can. Before Khan reaches him, Amargin leaps to his feet, eyes mad, and races for the chariot which our prize warriors used when going to fight. It's been sitting idle for over a year since the demon attacks began. Khan sees what Amargin intends and leaps from the rampart, roaring, No! Amargin stops, draws his sword, and points it at Khan. I'll kill anyone who tries to stop me. No bluff in the threat. Khan knows he'll have to fight the crazed warrior to stop him. He sizes up the situation, then decides it's better to let a margin go. He shakes his head and turns away. 
waves to those near the gate to open it.